Good evening and welcome to our Candidates Forum. This event is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of East Multnomah uh, County, the Association of University Women, Gresham Area Branch, and the Coalition of Gresham Neighborhood Associations. It's my pleasure to be the moderator this evening. My name is Deb Frick. I'm a League member. And our ground rules are very simple. We have questions that the League has prepared in advance. None of the, the candidates have seen the questions. I just got the questions yesterday, and I promise I haven't shared them with anyone. We will time responses, and we will open this forum with a two-minute opening statement from each candidate, and then we'll ask our questions. Many are very similar to our last session with our state senators. And then we'll conclude with closing statements of two minutes by each candidate. Okay, so, so let us begin. Uh, and I think for the sake of uh, simplicity, we have settled on an order of seating that is in order of house district and then alphabetical order. So you'll see that we have house district 49, House District 51, and House District 52, okay? With that in mind, let, let us start with Chris, and then we'll work our way down to Mark, okay? So Chris, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and I wanna thank the uh, League of Women Voters for setting this up, it's a, and it's, um, also nice that the city of Gresham has allowed us to use this wonderful facility. And I want to thank all of you who are out there um, to uh, witness this event. It's very important that people get a chance to see the folks that are running for public office uh, rather than simply reading about something in a, in a paper document or on, online. I uh, am from uh, southeast Portland. I grew up there in the 1960s and uh, was from a working class family. My dad was a mill worker for Crown Zeller back in West Lynn. My mom was a stay-at-home mom who took care of uh, children in the home. Uh, went to uh, public high school and then uh, did a little bit of time at the other community college, PCC. That's that, the one over there somewhere. Um, and then uh, continuing on with some public service issues that I had started in high school, I was a police explorer and then a police reserve. Um, I decided to apply and was fortunate enough to get hired by the Portland Police Bureau. Uh, I did that street level policing for oh, over seven years, almost seven and a half years. Uh, much of my adult life I've lived in East County and I um, <clears throat> spent, as I said, a little bit of time in policing and then decided to go back to school. Uh, eventually getting um, a master's and bachelor's from the University of Oregon and a PhD from Portland State. Um, I've been teaching uh, at Mount Hood for um, about 16 years and um, the reason that I am running today really has to do with an extension of that public service and that desire to um, work on issues related to education, job creation, and of course, uh, public safety. And so thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Matthew. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, you know, it's always wonderful that the League of Women Voters is here along with Metro East to host events like this. So thank you very much. Um, Can you speak into your microphone, please? Certainly. I was born and raised in East County. Um, grew up in, in Troutdale. Spent some time going to schools like Fairview Elementary School, and I was in the last class at Rockwood Middle School before they combined the high schools. I'm a graduate of Reynolds High School, class of 93, go Raiders. Um, I coined the phrase, the center of the universe, or someone had that applied to me as a criticism when I was in Salem. And, and the reason is that every person I talk to, I talk to about East County. It doesn't matter what the subject is. It doesn't matter why they want to see me. I talk about the Troutdale Reynolds Industrial Park and how that could create up to 10,000 jobs for our community. I talk about Rockwood and the needs that we have in the Triangle to develop a, a stronger community there. I talk about Wood Village and how the Multnomah Greyhound Park needs to be redeveloped desperately to create <coughs> jobs in that community. 
I'm proud to let people know how great East County is when I'm working down in Salem. When I, when I ran for this position two years ago, I talked a lot about jobs, and I'm proud to say that I delivered. We extended the Enterprise Zone for another 12 years. That's the Enterprise Zone, you might recall, that has created over 700 jobs in our community, putting people to work here instead of forcing them to drive across town. And see, that's important to me because I know we can't build a stronger East County. We can't build a stronger community if people spend dinner time and family time sitting in traffic, hoping beyond hope to get back from Hillsboro and time to make the Little League game before it gets dark. I also talked a lot about public safety. You know, the gang enforcement team is under siege, the funding for that, under siege every session. And I was proud to work with Representative Matthews across the aisle, the two young men from East County together, and we got that funded. I see my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Shamia. My name is Shamia Fagan, and I have a cold, so bear with me here. <laughs> I'm running for House District 51, and I'm running because Oregon, I know, can be a place of opportunity like it was for me and my family. I grew up in small towns in rural Oregon, and I was raised by my dad and my two older brothers. My mom struggled heavily with drug addiction and homelessness, literally on the streets of East Portland. And my dad, as a single parent, had a hard time making ends meet. And as you can imagine, my future did not feel all that bright. Until the fourth grade, I had a teacher in Dufer who saw something in me and wouldn't let me fall through the cracks. He invited me to join an after-school chess club. Don't look at me like that. Okay, chess club was very cool. <laughs> and by the end of that year, I traveled from tiny little Dufer to Portland, and I took first place at the Oregon State Chess Tournament. And I'll never forget the way that I felt when I was walking out of that parking lot and my older brothers, who were normally picking on me and doing what brothers do, that day they were hoisting my trophy over their heads and they were chanting, my sister's a chess champion. And for the first time in my life, I knew it doesn't matter that I don't have everything that other kids have. I can compete with anyone. And Oregon schools made that true. Because Oregonians invested in their schools, you invested in me. And it was a good investment. Because I worked hard, I put myself through college and law school, and I've built a career as a business attorney. But I also serve on the school board for David Douglas. Because when someone gives you a ladder from a rough place to a better place, you don't kick the ladder out. You hold it sturdy for the next group that's coming through. And that's why I serve on the school board, and that's why I'm running for state representative. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick. Good evening. Thanks, Deb, and thanks the, uh, to the uh, members of the Oregon uh, uh, League of Women Voters. Um, my name is Patrick Sheehan. I'm state representative for House District 51, uh, which was redistricted pretty dramatically to include a lot of East Portland. So over the last year and a half, I've been getting to know the East Portland community pretty well. Um, I, uh, my background is in advertising. I'm a small business owner. I've had an advertising agency for about 15 years. Um, and one of the reasons I got into the state legislature was because I felt like the legislature wasn't appreciating the commitment that business has made to their states and their communities, and that we needed people that knew about small business and knew how to grow it, uh, making those sort of decisions and not just suffocating everyone with, with more taxes and regulation. Uh, the big thing that you do as a, as a legislator is you prioritize. Uh, we're dealing with a finite set of money, uh, and right now we can't raise taxes on people right now. Um, the finite set of money that we've got, we've got to prioritize with education, public safety, and infrastructure. Uh, I've sort of carved out a niche in the infrastructure realm by uh, my leadership role in the House Transportation and Economic Development Committee. <coughs> so there we're making a lot of decisions and, and uh, doing a lot of research on things like the Columbia River Crossing, uh, things like the, the film and video tax credit that, that's part of our economic development package. We talk a lot about enterprise zones, uh, but the film and video tax credit actually brought some of the uh, productions like Grimm and Portlandia and Leverage here. About a $6 million investment last year returned $130 million in economic activity to the state. So that's a huge, huge bump. And uh, dollar for dollar, there's just no better tax credit that we offer. So things like that to, to get in, get your hands dirty, and uh, make some good decisions to get uh, Oregon back to business. You know, we've got a lot of folks in the legislature that sort of their solution is to just scream at an empty piggy bank. And uh, my solution is to try to get Oregonians to fill that piggy bank again. Thanks. Thank you. Peter. Thanks to the League of Women Voters for this opportunity, and thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Peter Nordby. I live in Brightwood, Oregon, and uh, I'm a retired 
uh, school, public school uh, employee. I was a teacher and administrator for 35 years, and I worked at the University of Phoenix for five years, and I've been in the education business for over 40 years. I have lots of stories to tell, but one thing I'd like to talk about as to why I got into this race. After World War II, Europe was in shambles, the United States was in shambles, and Japan was in shambles. And we came together under the Marshall Plan and we built one of the finest economies that the world has ever seen. We rebuilt Europe in an incredible time. We rebuilt the United States. We rebuilt Japan. It was all on the idea under partnership. It was a partnership between the people, the government, and a partnership between business. And there was equal shared sacrifice. Higher taxes than we've ever seen before, and yet we created this huge economy that, we've, that we may never see again unless we change our, our direction. Somewhere along in about 1980, we changed the paradigm. And the paradigm change was, well, the workers aren't quite as important as they, weren't, they once were. They're, not, they're kind of just assets to this. They're, you know, they're just not that important. So that was one change that we made. The other change is profit, and profitability became the bottom line. We stopped caring about working people. We stopped caring about pensions. We stopped caring about the things that made this country work, what made this country the grandest country in the world. We stopped caring about all of the things that really matter to the people of this country. So what do we see? Now we see education, we see jobs, we see people on the streets, and this is all because we've changed the paradigm. We did not, we did not complete the program. I, I want to go to Salem because I want to make a change. I want to add a different voice because the voices that we hear are very different. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Mark. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Thank you, women voters, for sponsoring this time tonight. I'm Mark Johnson. I am the state representative for House District 52, and I live in Hood River. So we're a long ways from my house. It took me a lot of uh, hoofing it to get here tonight, but uh, appreciate your patience. Um, I'm running again for re-election this year for much the same reasons I ran originally. And I originally threw my hat in the ring because I love Oregon. And I believe that who I am and what, I, what the qualifications that I have are the kind of qualifications that we need working in Salem on behalf of all of you. I'm a home builder. I'm a private business person. I understand what it's like to try to manage a payroll. I understand what it's like to try to stay in business when times get tough. I've done that. I've son, signed the front side of a paycheck. I understand the trials and the tribulations of being a small business owner. I'm also passionate about public education. I am and I continue to sit on the Hood River County School Board. I'm finishing my second uh, four-year term. And those experiences, being a private business person, being passionate about public education, were something I was able to put to work in my first term as a legislator. I was chosen to be one of the only fresh, actually the only freshman legislator that was able to co-chair a House Policy Committee. And I co-chaired the House Higher Ed Committee in the last session. And from that position, I was able to have a direct response, a direct hands-on role in helping to pass and reform and uh, shape our education system via the reforms. We passed this last session, worked very, very closely with the governor and his team and other legislators to pass through what I think are the most significant reforms in public education that this state has seen in a generation. We need to continue that work. I know I'm positioned well to be able to continue to help the governor in his agenda, to be able to help bring about bipartisan uh, job creation efforts, and we must continue to focus on private sector expansion because that really is the only way we're going to have the resources that we need and want for public education, for public safety, and for health care. So thank you for and look forward to the rest of our debate tonight. Thank you. Okay, now I'm just going to be randomizing here, okay? So be ready. I'm just going to be back and forth. Even though some of you are not competing with others, this is a forum. And so it is noted what House District you are competing for, but we're just going to throw it out. We're going to have a discussion, okay, with, with questions that are formatted and timed. So, Shamia, are you up for answering the first question? Do it. Okay. What will you do? to facilitate bipartisan cooperation and problem solving in the House? I will do what I've done on the school board. As a school board member, even though it's a nonpartisan office, there are people that are registered Democrats and registered Republicans on the school board. In fact, when I ran for the school board, I beat a 23-year incumbent to get on the board, and he was a Republican. And the two Republican members of the board who actively campaign against me and for their friend 
are now probably my closest allies on the board. After every single school board meeting, I go up to my former opponent's house with the two other school board members who were actively opposing me, and we have drinks. I did just have my first baby, so for the last year I've had virgin drinks, but we did. Uh, we go up there and we talk about the issues on the board, and we figure out a way to come together because it's not about Republican caucuses or Democratic caucuses on the school board. It's about how do we move the education agenda forward for David Douglas kids. In fact, my opponent, who I ran against on the school board and beat the 23-year incumbent has endorsed me in this race and is supporting me for this position despite being a Republican, despite being the person that I ran against to be on the school board, and I also have the support from the two other Republican members of the board. So I'll continue to do what I've done on the school board, which is any idea is a good idea and it doesn't come with a party label. And so for me, I will continue to advance good ideas regardless of who proposes them, just like I have on the David Douglas school board. Thank you. Okay, what do you what do you think about this, Peter? How what are you going to do to facilitate bipartisan cooperation and problem solving in the House? First of all, I bring those skills that uh, I learned in 35 years in in education. Uh, I know systematic problem solving like the back of my hand because as a principal, I had to problem solve every day, and I know conflict resolution, like the back of my hand, because conflict resolution is something I had to do every day. I know listening, and I know speaking, because those are things I had to do every day. So over 35 years, I had a lot of training. In 1996, uh, Park Rose, where I was uh, a middle school principal at the time, was going through tremendous turmoil. Some of you may remember. Uh, school boards were fighting. Teachers were unhappy with situations at the high school. We were building a new school, opening a new school. We had gang problems. We had uh, uh, all kinds of community problems that uh, fit into uh, uh, typical everyday kinds of things. And so I was transferred from Park Rose Middle School up to Park Rose High School to be the principal. And day one, I started working with people from diverse backgrounds. I started working with the teachers, with the students, with the parents. And we, within just a few months, became a very smooth running, very strong, forward directing school. And that was because not only was I able to um, put things together to make, to make it work, but people were willing to work with me because I was the kind of person who listens, the kind of person who problem solves, and the kind of person who does what he says. Okay, great, thank you. Chris? Well, you know, I worked in law enforcement for a long time. And in policing, you have a set of very important tasks to accomplish. And it brings together a lot of different groups and a lot of different people who have a lot of different perspectives. And working in an environment like that, you learn very quickly how to work cooperatively with people, how to work as a team, how to problem solve. Even if you may not agree on every little thing, you have to work um, to protect each other and to protect the public. So um, I've carried that forward. Um, in terms of um, the Troutdale City Council, it is uh, like many councils, uh, it's, uh, you don't declare your party. And so you work with people from um, all perspectives as well. And um, while there were very few Democrats on uh, the Troutdale Council, I can actually see a couple of people that I would still count as friends who are on the other side of the fence, and I think we worked very well. Um, and finally, the, um, I think one thing, too, is that when you are even in education, as you were talking about, um, Peter, you uh, have to learn to problem solve. Um, teaching college classes, I have to balance all sorts of different opinions so that I inspire people and not turn them off because they're not thinking exactly the way I think. So that's what I would, that's what I would take to Salem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Matthew, what do you, what's your take? You know, facilit facilitating bipartisanship is really about personal relationships. Uh, you have to be willing to humbly go to someone in the other party and talk to them as if they're a real person, and they are. You know, and, and I'll give you the best example I have. I watched Jules Bailey, the representative from Selwood, give the most impassioned speech I had ever seen talking about the Teen uh, Dating Violence Act, the uh, Healthy Teen Relationships Act, and it failed. He, for, for some machinations that are really irrelevant, he wasn't able to get the bill passed. And as soon as that bill went down, I went right over to his desk. And I sat down next to him and I said, Jules, 
I will make the Healthy Teen Relationships Act one of my priority bills in the short session if you will work with me on it. And he did. And we met with Senator Laurie Montes Anderson to resolve all of the problems that the Oregon School Boards Association had with the bill. We sat in a room together with a spirit of trust and bipartisanship, and we got it done. So now all of a sudden we're down in Salem in September and I have another bill that will help create local jobs. And guess what? My good friend, Representative Jules Bailey, walked across the, the dais and he said, Matt, I want to work with you on this bill. That's how you facilitate bipartisanship. You live it, you breathe it, you be respectful, and you maintain and cultivate personal relationships in a respectful way. And the last thing that you cannot do, because this will kill bipartisanship faster than anything else, you have to make honest and fair arguments in support of your position, and you cannot put other people down or be disrespectful. Thank you. Now let's swing way over here to Mark. What do you think? I think that, um, I guess I'll second some of Shamea's comments in that my school board experience prepared me to be able to function in a bipartisan way. That really has paid off big time in the legislature. Um, when we come together as a school board, or we have one objective, and that is to do what's best for kids. It doesn't matter whether you're a windsurfer, a kite boarder, a mountain biker, or a fruit farmer. Uh, you come together to do what's best for kids. And I've used that same uh, philosophy as a legislator as well. Um, my co-chair on the House Higher Ed Committee is Representative Michael Dembro from Northeast Portland, and he and I could not be more dissimilar, okay? We are way different people. We would not fellowship. We would not hang out with one another, except the fact that we both serve the state of Oregon. And when we come together to do the work of the higher ed committee, we focus on what we can agree on. And we've worked very, very collaboratively well together. And I think that speaks for itself. We've been labeled as the Felix and Oscar of the Oregon House, and I think there's some real truth in that. But a, a real practical example would be a bill that, uh, w that was in the Senate last year. It was uh, Senator Hass had a bill to approve all-day kindergarten and make it mandatory that it be offered by, I think, about 2015. I went to Senator Hass and I said, Senator, I think I can get you a lot more bipartisan support for this bill if we make it permissive. Don't make this a mandate. Let's just make this permissive. Those districts that want to and are able to do that, allow them to do it when they can do that. He slipped that amendment in, the bill sailed through with bipartisan support, and it became known as the Johnson Amendment to the Haas Bill. Finally, I guess I would just say that Governor Kitzhaber's support of my campaign, I think, speaks for itself for my ability to function in well in a bipartisan fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick, what do you think? Can I just say ditto? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one of the one of the things that I'm most proud of is is that I was part of this this historic 30-30 split partisan legislature, um, and when we got out when when Sine Die came the next day the Oregonian had a gigantic headline that said Oregon's Sunday School Legislature, and it was talking about how we all got along. We had to, and we wanted to. Uh, we have these great relationships that uh, that, that Matt and, and Mark uh, mentioned that. Uh, we all have stories of these bills that have gone through, uh, you know, when, and I have such good friends on the other side of the aisle, you just build those relationships. Uh, they had to separate Brian Clem and I on, on uh, committee because we were cracking each other up too much during the committee, and he's on the other side uh, of the aisle for me, and he now sits on the other side of the dais uh, in, our, um, in our General Government Consumer Protection Committee. Uh, and he and I worked together on sponsoring what we ended up calling the Frankenstein Bill because it had so much stuff in it. Uh, but it, we actually got a very controversial bill that had to do with land use and annexation actually through, uh, through the House. Um, and finally, I will say one of the, the interesting, kind of the dumb things that we did that was sort of fun, uh, right at the end of the session, we, uh, I came up with the idea of Tuxedo Tuesday, okay, where we would all wear tuxedos as a metaphor to say, look, things are getting tense. Let's remember to be civil. And that took off, and in the, the short session, we had, uh, I think, eight or nine legislators wearing tuxedos. And it got picked up by the media, and it was just a real neat story and metaphor. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, now we're moving to question number two. How can we make Oregon more attractive to businesses that want an educated and highly trained workforce? And I'm going to throw that out to Matthew first. <clears throat> well, um, a couple of things. You, you know, it's very challenging to stand up and say that you are committed to K through 12 being the number one funding priority. But that's our obligation. 
you have to be prepared to stand up and vote against the K through K 12 education bill because you don't think it's enough money. That's what I did. You know, when I ran two years ago, I promised my neighbors that I would fight to make sure that the K through 12 education budget was the first budget passed. We delivered on that promise. And the reason why that was important is because I didn't want businesses or Doonesbury looking at the state of Oregon saying, oh, look, they passed their budget in July and every school district in the state has to cut days and they have a month to refigure their budget before school starts. But recognizing that I wanted to fulfill that promise, but then looking at the budget number that unfortunately the education establishment in Salem was advocating for, $5.7 billion, was frustrating. And I had people sitting in my office and I said, help me help you. Let's advocate together for 6.2 or 6.3. And the response was, well, children can't learn if they're hungry. And I said, I understand that. But they have to learn in order for us to have a stronger state and a stronger community. So I voted no. Thank you. Chris, what do you think? How can we make Oregon more attractive to businesses that want an educated and highly trained workforce? Well, education definitely is... I think the foundation of, of society in general, both nationally and in the state of Oregon. Um, if we do not have the, um, the folks that are trained, uh, which I believe Scott actually alluded to before, if you don't have that workforce ready to go, then you're going to have a problem attracting businesses here. So we know education is very important. Now how can we get there, which I think is your question. The um, first thing that I think we have to do is we have to look at the state education budget and look to make sure, and all budgets have these problems, um, that there aren't any inefficiencies. And I think that uh, we can go through and make sure that we do not have, for instance, too much um, uh, upper management in the place of teachers. Uh, if you can reduce some of that, then you have monies that you can put into education, the basic operations. I think, too, we can look very carefully at a lot of the tax incentives that we have across the state and look at those and very systematically decide if they work or not. If they work, then we should keep them. But those that don't, that's another place where we might get monies that we can then transfer into education to beef up education and make it so that we have the workforce and people want to come here for the workforce. Thank you. Shamia? I ditto what has been said by Representative Juan and Chris Gorsick. This is fundamental. My two brothers, I, I told you my story that Oregon allowed me to put myself through college and law school, but my brothers, college wasn't the right path for them. But when they were in high school, we had incredible vocational programs, and they had wood shop and welding and mechanics. And today they both own homes and support their families with those jobs because they had the skills right out of high school. None of them have, neither of them have community college training or any type of college training, but they, through high school, had the skills they needed to join Oregon businesses and become contributing members of the Oregon economy. This is critical. There are stories, I've listened to Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian talk about businesses that were considering coming here. When they looked at our education system and said, yeah, I don't know that I can actually trust a steady, educated workforce coming out of Oregon schools. Intel, when you look at why Intel actually came here, Back in the 70s, they mentioned Oregon's green spaces, they mentioned our mountain, and they mentioned our schools. Because Oregon schools were able to graduate kids that even in the 70s were able to enter the technology sector right out of high school. And we need to get back there. And we're not going to get back there when the Education Week says that we're 42nd in the country when it comes to education quality. We are in the bottom 10 states when it comes to the percentage of our general fund that we invest in education. That needs to change, and I'm running to make sure that it does. Thank you. Patrick, what's, what's your take? Well, uh, in order to attract an educated workforce to Oregon to live here, I actually have a bill that didn't go anywhere last session, and I'd like to see it go somewhere this session, as the Oregon Student Loan Interest Tax Deduction. This lets you write off your student loan interest the same way most people write off mortgages. There's a federal tax deduction that's means tested that's not applicable after a certain income level, which people with very heavy debt loads 
doctors and lawyers and engineers uh, can't, can't use that, that tax deduction. So this is an Oregon-specific tax deduction. They can write up to $20,000 a year off of their income. So um, I talked with the, the uh, lead researcher, president of OHSU, uh, Cancer Research, and he's very excited about, uh, about this program. Um, also, th investing in things like STEM programs, science, technology, engineering, and math for young people, um, getting, getting them interested in, in careers and inspired by people that are actually in the business of, of research and innovation and technology. Um, and we also need to recognize that an educated and trained workforce is also higher wage earners. And if we bring them to the state of Oregon to work, chances are they're going to be looking at the state of Washington to live. And that's just because of our fundamental tax code problem. Thank you. Peter, what do you think? The quality schools program that we've uh, been monitoring for years and years uh, puts us at about $2 billion under what we need to fully fund our public schools to have a quality program. And how you're going to do that is the question that you're asking. First of all, I think every state legislator needs to be looking at what the costs are at the state level and make sure those programs are, are closed. The other thing are the tax loopholes. There's millions of dollars that are going out. Uh, it's been alluded to, we need to take a look at, at uh, on those loopholes. Are they really helping the state or are they just uh, filling some pocketbooks of a few people? We also had um, over a $300 million um, uh, reserve fund that some of that could have very well been put into the education program. Uh, uh, I'm really concerned when I look at uh, the class size. I've talked to second grade teachers who have 40 in their class, 35 in kindergarten classes. This is not how you operate a school. The other thing I do really quickly is um, I would change this top-down testing model. It is not good for kids. It doesn't create the kind of job force that we really want. It puts huge pressure on teachers. It's top-down mandated. It's 35 years in the system. I can't tell you how many top-down mandated programs that I've seen that don't work, cost lots of money, doesn't work, and in fact creates the kind of learner that's opposite of what we want to uh, achieve in this state. And uh, where's critical thinking? Where, where's all our research on brain research that, that, that is just huge? So let's start there. Thank you. And Mark? <clears throat> just a quick comment. Uh, Kev, um, Peter mentioned reserves. Um, that ending fund balance that we left in the budget uh, at, the begin at the end of the last biennium uh, made it possible so that we didn't have to ask for money back from, from school boards and from school districts when the economic, when the revenue forecasts have fallen below what was projected. So it was necessary. Um, many occasions during this last session, as I chaired the House Higher Ed, I had in re executives from Intel or Tektronix or other high-tech companies within Oregon say, you know, Representative Johnson, we don't go to India and China looking for engineers and bringing them back here because we simply want to boost Oregon tourism. They do it because we're not producing the type of graduates with the degrees and the qualifications and the training that they need. Um, all of the education reforms we passed this last session are built on changing that dynamic. Going to a seamless P20 continuum within our public education system is about improving it from start to finish so that we can produce the type of qualified, trained, educated Oregonians that our businesses here in Oregon want. Uh, we've made great inroads on, on this and we have to continue to create those seamless partnerships between K-12, between higher ed to ensure that there's career technical education opportunities as well as we are planting those seeds for higher ed experience in kids clear down in middle school so that they can be on a path academically to make sure that they can reach their successful uh, conclusion when they graduate from high school and go on to post-secondary training so we're on track and we've made some great strides in this er in this area thank you thank you okay now our third question and i'm going to uh, ask patrick so i'm going to give him a kind of a thinking moment there uh, if tax reform is necessary, how can politics be taken out of the reform process? Well, you have the right people in there making those decisions that aren't concerned with making a career out of politics. I think that's one of the, the key things. Um, you know, politics is going to be there for uh, negotiating, trying to get some of these bills through, but at the end of the day, we need to recognize that we have to do some of these big reforms, not just tax reform, but uh, PERS reform. You know, we've got uh, a horrible problem. We're going to walk into the session with $900 million that we need to come up with, uh, you know, in order to just keep things the way they are, and, and that's not acceptable. So um, putting partisanship aside and uh, 
it, it, certainly it's there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't make decisions based on, on politics, and I know that there's, there's lots of people on both sides of the aisle that don't. That's just what we need to, to follow. So. Thank you. Shamil, what do you think? Well, first, you have to recognize it's going to be hard. Right. I mean, taxes are not fun. Nobody likes taxes. The ideal position for any leader, politician, would be to cut them for everybody. And so the realization that we need to have all solutions at the table and have forward thinking people who are going to realize that while this may be painful in the short run, in the end, it's going to make Oregon more sustainable and a place to attract business and a place where our kids can be educated regardless of what the national economy is doing. And so I think that obviously, you know, Politics is is a natural thing that comes out of a in bipart or a bicameral legislature when you have Republicans and Democrats and caucuses. So the, you know recognition is it's going to be hard, but people need to to be committed to that and to be committed to doing what's best for Oregon, even if it burns someone in your own party or burns someone who is a supporter of yours. Thank you, Mark. What do you think? Could you restate the question one more sure. time? Sure. If tax reform is you know is necessary how can politics be taken out of the reform process okay thank you i believe tax reform is necessary um, i think there's no doubt that our high income tax and our high capital gains taxes in oregon are discouraging wealth creation and wealth maintenance in oregon anybody who's seen the traffic flow going north on i-205 or i-5 at rush hour knows that there's a lot of wealth leaves this state and I believe a lot of it's because of our high tax our high income tax and, and capital gains tax this afternoon I was up at the the, the uh, resort at the mountain where Associated Oregon Industries was having actually a forum on this very topic Governor Kitzhaber was there today and he's willing to take this issue on and I believe that we need to but we have to do it in a way that eliminates the gotcha politics it so often typifies this discussion if somebody ventures out on the table and throws something out there that becomes risky, the next thing you know, it ends up in hit pieces and, and their political career is over. So we've got to put that aside. And thirdly, and, and we just need to also recognize that if we're going to make any progress on this issue, it has to be bipartisan. One party cannot take ownership of this and have any sort of changes be transcendent or lasting. So we've got, to, we've got to be serious about this. We've got to do what's right for Oregon. We need to recognize that if we're going to compete with our neighbors, we need a tax system here that it keeps people here and it encourages people to be successful so that we have the resources we need for public education, health care, and public safety. Thank you. Peter, what do you think? First of all, if um, the governor said that uh, that he would like to see the tax codes rewritten, and I would certainly support that. If you're going to do it the right way, you have to start with a vision of what you want for your state. And that vision has to be inclusive, and it has to be a panoramic view of what and who we are as a, as a state. And then you have to develop a tax code that matches that vision. It doesn't exclude certain people in the population. You see, right now, all we're hearing about is there's these job creators out there, these special people who create the jobs who are going to solve all of our problems. Well, let me tell you something. I'm a job creator. I buy gas from the local gas station. I buy groceries at the grocery store. I buy shoes at the shoe store. I buy locally. I buy from local products. And I, I create jobs because of, of my priorities. We are... Um, leaving out a whole group of people in, in this uh, paradigm, and that's the consumer. And the consumers are, are critical in, in a supply and demand market. And uh, I, I am a PERS member. I receive uh, PERS payments and so forth. After 35 years, I deserve the money. It's deferred payments, and I'm proud of the work that I put in. But now we're telling our people that they don't deserve their pensions. We're going to take, we're going to piecemeal. The private pensions are gone. We're going to go after the public pensions, and then we're going to solve all of our problems. Well, I'll tell you, the problems won't be solved once they're all gone. It's going to get worse. Thank you. Okay, let's swing down to the end here. Chris, you want to add in to this? Absolutely. Well, um, tax reform is something that comes up a lot, as you all know. Um, the one thing that is, uh, I think, a positive sign is that the governor has recently uh, created a panel of both unions, union members, and business people who are currently looking at ways to reform the tax system in the state of Oregon. What better way than to talk to 
workers on the one side and business leaders on the other side and try to work out something that will be acceptable and usable to the general population. So I think the governor is definitely on the right track with that, and I would certainly endorse other measures that would continue to follow that. Um, I think, too, you have to go back to uh, what I mentioned before, and uh, I think has been mentioned a couple of other times, and that's to go back and look at tax incentives and make sure that they do work. There's no point in keeping them if they don't. And um, finally, you need to listen, as I think many people, both on the, the Senate side and on this panel, have said, you need to listen to people. It doesn't matter if there's a D or an R after their name. What matters is, is this a really good, solid suggestion? And if it is, then we should work on it together, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Matthew, what's your opinion? I think that I, all of Oregon learned something in 2009. We were on the cusp of the Great Recession, and let me tell you, we raised taxes and fees like nobody's business. Four billion dollars worth over four years, and let me tell you, if raising taxes could fix an economy, we have the best economy in the country, and we don't. So I think you have to look at values. The first value is that the voters need to be included, they need to vote on a, a new compromise in tax policy. Because that gives us the opportunity to solve some of the issues that have cropped up in the tax revolt of the 1980s and 90s, of which you know Gresham, of course, was ground zero. And if you don't engage the folks that created the tax revolt in the first place, you're going to fail. Secondly, it needs to be revenue neutral. And the reason why it needs to be revenue neutral in the short term is because otherwise you are raising taxes yet again in a weak economy, which doesn't work. Thirdly, our tax system needs to be pro-economic growth. We cannot continue to, to fail to create enough jobs for our kids to live here and find jobs here. We cannot continue attacking businesses, preventing businesses from locating here, preventing small businesses from growing, preventing people from creating or building that first office building. Pro-growth tax policies are the road to prosperity. Those three values, if we commit to them, we can get the politics out of the way and get it done. I like that timer sound. Yeah. That's a good At one. At least it was an Oregon duck. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, let's go on to our fourth question. And uh, let's see. Who should start this one out? How about... Um, Patrick, no, you did that before. How about Matthew? You want to, to swing in on this? Sure. What kind of support would you suggest to promote and help maintain small businesses in Oregon? <clears throat> well, I'm a small business owner, and I represent a lot of small business owners. And in, since 2008, I've seen dozens of my clients go out of business. I've seen the, the risky business takers go out of business early. I've seen the responsible business owners go out of business more recently. But this economy has devastated them. And the one consistent theme that I have seen is that access to capital is critical. Now, when, when you're a small business owner and you need to make payroll, having that line of credit, whether it's from a bank or from, from a, a friend or a relative that has uh, something a little more private in place, that's key. Um, that makes the difference sometimes. And so what I put together was um, a bill that uh, was co-sponsored by Representative Jules Bailey. And, and it's an investment act that encourages people to invest in real estate here in Oregon, in the corner store, to lend them money or buy stock in a small company here so that they have that capital to hire our neighbors. And that's a bill uh, that I will be proposing again in 2013, again, with Representative Jules Bailey, uh, because we know that people in Oregon, we're hard workers. If we have the opportunity to start a business and grow it and hire our neighbors, that's what will happen. But we can't get there if we don't have funding for our businesses and if people aren't encouraged to sell their stocks and invest in their neighbor's business. Okay. Mark, what do you think about this? Well, I think it begins with uh, keeping the burden on them as low as possible, i.e. taxes and regulations. You keep the tax burden low because you, as you continue to keep the size of the government 
as small as it needs to be. That's why I always thought it was such a great idea, and, and so thankful that we'll be a part of balancing the budget this last session only with available revenues rather than looking for additional sources of revenue which would have been placed a greater burden on, on small businesses and on, on individuals. I think you, um, obviously, as a small business guy, as somebody who goes out to get building permits, I deal with land use regulations, we deal with zoning uh, regulations and so forth, you know. Cities, counties, uh, states can be either helpful, but they can also be very, very uh, burdensome by throwing up unnecessary roadblocks to those sort of projects. We have to continue to allow our businesses to grow as they need to and so forth. And third, I think we need to have some incentives for businesses to expand. I would support, we had a bill this last session that would have allowed small businesses to be able to actually write off or deduct the cost of expanding their business footprint. If somebody wanted to add on another bay to their automotive shop because their business uh, model re, uh, was, was such that they could do that, they should be able to write off that cost. And if we can have some incentives there for small businesses to take their own capital, put it to work, putting Oregonians back to work, creating incomes in this state, I think we'll have a much more robust private sector. So those are just a few ideas. Thank you. Peter, what do you think? Would you uh, repeat that question again? Sure. What kind of support would you suggest to promote and help maintain small businesses in Oregon? From the legislative level, I think that incentives, uh, education, preparing an education workforce that, uh, that can uh, uh, help build those businesses, loans and grants, those are all things that uh, are important that the state can do. I'd like to go back to some of my in initial statements. After World War II, and I hate to be historical about this, but after World War II, we had no choice. We had come out of the Great Depression. We um, had been decimated by a war. Europe, Japan, China, the United States were all in, in, uh, in horrendous position. What we did is we rallied and focused upon a shared uh, commitment to make the economy work. Um, I, I believe the governor has talked about a task force to, to uh, support job creation, small business, but it's going to take that kind of effort. It has to be a task force kind of effort with a uh, huge priority where everyone's included and everyone's valued in the system. That's what's going to make a difference. And it's not a matter of small government or uh, big government or little taxes or small taxes. It's putting together a package that will work for everybody in spite of the ideologies involved. Thank you. Shamia, what do you, what do you think? Well, I'm a business attorney, and so I work with Oregon's small businesses all day. That's my job. And <coughs> in meeting with many of my clients since I've been running for this office, clients with five employees, clients with 500 employees, have asked them, you know, what is it going to take for you to create jobs? And a lot of them have had all kinds of different ideas, but the one continuing trend throughout all of them is demand. When more people are buying my product or service and I need to hire, then I will hire more employees. And I think that's one thing that constantly gets missed in this discussion is when regular Oregonians have more money to spend, they create demand. And when they create demand, small businesses create jobs. And when I've met with people on the doorstep who say, you know, because of the state of our schools, they're sending their kids to private school when they can barely afford it. Well, that's thousands of dollars a month in tuition to private schools that they're not spending at the local bakery or the local mechanic shop or the local pottery shop. And so I think one thing we need to not miss is that job creation comes from the bottom up. It is a demand society. But some of the things the state can do Make sure that state contracts go to Oregon companies. We shouldn't be using state money to help out-of-state businesses. Second, match up community colleges with community, excuse me, community colleges with small businesses so that our community colleges are training people in the jobs that the businesses need. And third, cut red tape that serves no real purpose. I met with a business owner who asked to pay for tests every year to prove the DEQ that she's not violating the law when she's never actually violated it. That's an environmental regulation that would need to go away. Thank you. Chris. Um, one thing that I think uh, we can do is, as legislators, um, some of these things are based on city and county um, requirements. But uh, while we may not be able to then directly influence them, we can, uh, as we've talked about working with other legislators, we can work with cities and counties to encourage them to reduce some of the fees that have been described up here and to reduce some of the studies and other requirements that uh, have been, in some cases, rather 
um, wrongly placed upon um, businesses. There's a business in Gresham, it's Gresham Animal Hospital, many of you may know it. Uh, Dr. Chris built a brand new building on the other side of his lot and was going to be forced to do a $50,000 traffic study when he wasn't moving and changing the traffic pattern. He's just lucky that he had an old email from 2003 that a city official had said they didn't have to do that or he would have had to pay that. Another thing we can do, um, Oregon puts out a lot of contracts. The state of Oregon does a lot of jobs itself. We should be funneling as many of those jobs to state and small business folks um, so that uh, they get the benefit of those um, jobs and hire more people. Um, we obviously, too, need to realize that um, we have to um, work on our infrastructure. And Thank if we you. do that, that'll help, too. Thank you. Sorry about that. Patrick, you're up. Well, thank you. Uh, it, instead of saying what I'd like to do, I'd rather tell you some of the things that I've done and, uh, and, and give you the reasons why every business advocacy organization out there has, has given me their endorsement that offer one. Um, there are two things. You have advocacy and you have policy. So on the advocacy side, I've done things like I got an email from a, a jewelry store owner in Clackamas who was just outside my district, but he, uh, he sent out a shotgun email blast to a ton of different legislators saying, please stop this bill. This is going to put me out of business. And it was a, a bill put forward by the pawnbrokers to make things easier for pawnbrokers to buy and sell gold, uh, which affected jewelry store owners negatively. Um, so no one was listening to him. I, I called him back. I, out of the eight people that he contacted, I was the only one that called him back. And I went and talked to the committee chair, and we had the bill stopped. We brought it back in the next session so that it, it could uh, go through with the intended uh, consequence, which is uh, protecting all Oregonians from these traveling shows that come by. Uh, but it also protected the... Um, protected the uh, jewelry store owners. Um, also, things like um, there was a bill for, that uh, had duplicate regulation to what the FCC does. It had to do with website design, saying that if you uh, agree to a contract, the typeface has to be a certain size, the button has to be a certain color, uh, the disclosure has to be in a certain place in the screen. This is specific to Oregon? It's ridiculous. Uh, you're going to have companies that are just not doing business in Oregon online because we have some bizarre separate thing. Um, and this was being handled by the FCC. Quack. Thank you. Okay. Um, our fifth question, explain your top three legislative priorities and how you plan to achieve them. And I'm going to ask Mark to come up with his answer first. First, um, we have got to do everything we can do to help our private sector create jobs in this state. It's job number one because a robust private sector is going to produce the revenues that we all want to have for education, for health care, for public safety. Two, my second priority is going to be um, continuing to help the education reforms that we passed this last session to actually be implemented. There's a lot of policy in the pipeline. The system doesn't need more policy, but it mean, needs help implementing the policy and so forth. This is where I can use my experience, and I am using my experience as a school board member, to try to provide the tools necessary for school boards to be able to manage their personnel and to be able to manage their budgets in a way that are going to allow them to successfully fulfill the demands being placed upon them by some of the policies that we passed. Okay? The school boards across this state are being asked to do things they've never been asked to do before. They need help. I know how to provide that help, and I'm working closely with Oregon School Boards Association to provide some legislative help for them. Third, um, the big th there, is an, there is an elephant in the room tonight we haven't addressed yet, and it's called PERS. We have got to do something about the, the cost that PERS is wreaking on our public sector in the state. It trickles down to schools, it trickles down to public safety, it trickles down to health care, and unless the legislature does something about PERS, we're going to continue to see a deterioration of the public sector in this state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, how, how about uh, Peter? You want to respond to that? Certainly a priority of mine is education. I think that uh, the current reform movement is off on the right uh, track. There are some concerns that I have with it, but uh, first of all, the uh, seamless nature of it, the um, 
consolidating the education department, which was dysfunctional before, and now we have uh, a new bureaucracy that's that's uh, funded almost double what we had before, so we need to take a look at that. But there's a lot of things in there that I'm concerned about, and it's a top-down testing model uh, uh, attached to um, to uh, teacher evaluation, which I think is uh, misguided. We have to create jobs, and we have to do that by supporting local small business opportunities, hiring locally, buying locally, and focusing a task force on how we're going to get people back to work and needs to be a major priority. I'm going to add something that hasn't been talked much, and that's the environment and climate change. I'm really concerned because ultimately we now have about a two degree uh, difference in our climate. This is going to have impact on our whole economy. It's going to have impact on everything that we do. The, mo the scientific models that we looked at are showing that uh, within uh, 20, 25 years, we could have up to seven degrees increase in, um, in temperature. That's going to devastate everything that we have uh, worked for in this state and other states. We see some of that in effect. And we better start taking a, a look at that. I know there's differences in belief as to whether it's uh, man-caused or not, but uh, uh, it, it's a serious problem. Thank you. Patrick? Well, uh, job creation, of course, is the number one. Um, we also need to, uh, I think one of the things that we did right this last time was we funded education before anything else in the state budget. And we put an extra $100 million past what the governor recommended into that. And that prevented it from being cut further by projected revenue shortfalls, and it pre prevented it from being used as a political football at the end of the session, which is so often done in the legislature. Uh, the other priority is uh, the Columbia River crossing. We need to make a decision. Uh, whether that decision is yes or no, it's our job to reach across the aisle, get the, um, uh, get the negotiations through, get everybody educated in what's real and what's not. The media has been having a heyday with all sorts of things like uh, the Coast Guard decision, which was not a decision at all. It was a uh, suggestion that they made with some criticisms, and it's uh, appropriate for them to have those. So I'd like to have those discussions, get that out so we can make that decision, because we need to either uh, make that decision yes or, or no, because we're just bleeding money right now by, uh, by having it in limbo. And the other thing that it just picked up, the health insurance exchange. Um, I have a background in advertising and interaction active development and one of the portions of the health insurance exchange is a technology platform. I sat in on a uh, meeting two days ago where I was demoed an actual working live demo of a health insurance exchange. Instead, our great state of Oregon is deciding to build it on their own and it's not going to work. And so I'm going to try to get them uh, to go with buying software rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Chris, what do you think? Well, um, obviously job creation is a, a huge part of uh, what we need to be focusing on. Um, I think we can uh, do that by making a concerted effort to focus on the infrastructure of the state. We're dealing with a highway system from the 30s, a freeway system from the 50s through the 70s, and it is wearing out. And if it wears out, it makes it harder for commerce to operate as well as for the average person to move about. And, uh, you know, if you have highways all jammed up, air quality issues are another concern. So we could create a lot of long-term jobs by the state having a concerted effort to focus on rebuilding this infrastructure. Um, and some people might say, well, that's the federal government. But remember, more and more programs have to have a matching state component. So it's both the federal and the state. Same thing with education. I'm very interested in a lot of different issues with education, but one that is somewhat gone uh, unnoticed is all of the deferred maintenance in educational facilities. We have millions of dollars of deferred maintenance just across the um, higher education system, the, the, the main universities, as well as uh, endless amounts more um, for the rest of the system. So that's another way to create more jobs for the long term. And finally, I would like to see TriMet turned into a public board that is voted on by the public, not appointed by the governor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, whoops. Oh, I got a gift from the audience here. Okay, and Matthew. Um, in June, we found out that Danielle Tudor and another victim of the jogger rapist were not going to be allowed to testify at the jogger rapist parole hearing. 
And as I delved a little more deeply into that issue, I found out that um, Tiffany Edens had been so victimized by testifying at his first parole hearing two short years ago um, that her life had fallen apart and that she had experienced a resurgence of her post-traumatic stress disorder. And when I read about that, I was angry because I remembered the jogger rapist as a child in the news, and I remember being afraid. Um, so I have a parole reform bill. I don't think it's right that when somebody admits to victimizing a person but isn't convicted, whether it's because of a parole deal or because of the statute of limitations expiring, that that victim is not treated fairly by the parole board. It's also appalling to me that inmates every two years can get another hearing and can re-victimize the people that they already scared to death when they committed the crime in the first place. So I have a complete bill ready to go. It reforms uh, parole. It's, a, it's been already, the ideas are endorsed by the Gresham Outlook, and I'll be pursuing that. The second is the Columbia River crossing. Um, we can't have the bottleneck from Canada to Mexico. Uh, that creates a lot of jobs, and it's absolutely necessary for us to build that bridge. And third, to create jobs in our local community, I have my Invest in Oregon Act, uh, which provides the incentives to invest in local businesses where we know uh, will be the foundation for the economic recovery with local jobs. Okay. I wanted that duck. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's great. Now, Shamia, I asked you that question, didn't no. I? No. Okay, great. Thank you. So I agree. The first first priority has to be jobs. With increasing jobs in this state, then we'll have the money to pay for the services that Oregonians care about. I agree that we need to improve the infrastructure infrastructure in this state. There's studies that have shown that if you create one job in the manufacturing or construction industry, that job supports two and a half jobs in the service sector. To me, that's a huge bang for your buck when it comes to government investment. Create one job in the construction and manufacturing sector, you're actually creating three and a half jobs. So to me, that's a place to prioritize, not just the Columbia River Crossing and other things that have been mentioned, but also in the local community. In my district is Powell Boulevard, which is so decrepit that the only businesses that want to locate there are mon mini marts, pawn shops, and strip clubs. And it's a 35 mile an hour road. There are no sidewalks. I was canvassing there this summer and I had to walk through a strip club parking lot because there are no sidewalks and I didn't want to walk in the road. And I, w I got harassed just walking there. And first of all, I was seven months pregnant, so gross. But these guys harassed me. And this is some kids walk to school because there's an elementary school and a middle school right there. So we need to not just invest in the big projects, but the little projects like Powell Boulevard. My second priority would definitely be stable and adequate education funding. That's a no-brainer. And third, we have to have adequate public safety. I read the other day that the Oregon State Police is so underfunded, they get 40 calls a day where they have to say, I'm sorry, we don't have anyone in the area to respond. As a woman, that would be a terrifying response to get from a police officer. Thank you. All right. Uh, our Oregon Constitution requires that we provide adequate funding to meet basic needs. How would you meet that requirement, Chris? Well, I think once again, we would have to um, go back to the consideration of what we have to work with. Right now, it would be absolutely um, wrong to think that you can raise taxes. Um, it's bad enough, uh, the fees that have been described and, and some of the studies and other things that are required. So what we have to do is go back to some things that I touched on before. We need to look at the tax incentives that we have, systematically study those, make sure that they work. Those that don't, sunset those. Um, we can also look for efficiencies, not just in education, but across um, the spectrum in terms of uh, uh, public jobs. Uh, I read something recently in the Chronicle of Higher Education that indicated that across the country, um, higher ed is top heavy in administration. And I think that's true here in the state of Oregon as well. So there are some places that we can look right now today to help make sure that police, fire, medical, social services are funded. Um, I was told recently by the state police that they now um, are pol policing 
Douglas County because Douglas County ended their sheriff's deputy patrols because they couldn't afford to operate them. That's outrageous. Okay. Thank you. Matthew? You know, uh, growing up in East County, you learn something at a very young age. I, I think I learned it sitting on my grandfather's knee, that there are people that live in the big city that look at East County as if it's their personal park. And they're not really fussed about the people that live there. And one of the things that I recognized uh, serving East County in Salem is that if you really care about poverty, it's not good enough to only talk about the poverty that you see in the big city or in the suburbs. We have passed policies in my lifetime that have actively created poverty in rural parts of the state of Oregon. It's true. Everything from intentionally shutting down the timber industry almost completely to refusing farmers in Eastern Oregon the opportunity to use even half the water from the Columbia River that our counterparts in Washington use. We have a county right now, Josephine County, that is basically an experiment in anarchy because they don't have the money to have more than the elected sheriff. And a big part of the reason that those things are going on are the votes that are taking place statewide and the way that people in Portland and in the metro area ignore what is happening in rural Oregon. We want to provide for basic needs. We need people in the big city to think about water and timber in a different way and think about rural poverty and care about it as much as they care about the poverty that they see. Thank you. Mark? The only constitutional requirement I'm aware of that talks about fully funding is related to education, so I'm going to answer the question that way. I think we have to try to define what adequate is, or what does it mean to fully fund education. We hear that tossed around a lot, but it's really difficult to quantify. And I think there's a few points that need to be made here as you talk about, I mean, it's easy to say there are, there are not enough dollars in the K-12 classrooms, there are not enough money for higher ed. But public education involves more than just simply dollars. Performance has come about because things work well together because kids are learning. And, and an example of this is that in the, the high water mark for funding public education occurred in the 0405 biennium when actually K-12 funding received about 44% of the general fund. You look at the testing data, that is not the high water mark for academic performance. There is no direct cause effect relationship relating to academic performance of K-12 students and the level of funding. I'm not saying that it doesn't help, but I'm saying there is no direct relationship there. How we get about getting me measured outcomes is about making sure we have policies in place to allow school boards to manage their districts, to allow them to manage their personnel so that we can make sure that there's is a cohesive framework in place that where outcomes are achieved and outcomes are, are, are given. But, but also we have to make sure that this PERS situation is dealt with because right now the PERS withholding rate in my district in Hood River County is 32% on every salary dollar paid. That's 32% of the money that comes from Salem goes right back to Salem to replenish that PERS reserve fund. It's unsustainable. Thank you. Peter? I'd like the question one more time, please. Sure. Our Oregon Constitution requires that we provide adequate funding to meet basic needs, and basic is in capital, you know, letters. How would you meet that requirement? First of all, I would need a clear definition of what the basic needs are, if that includes safety, housing, food, shelter, clean air, clean uh, water those kinds of things, then that has to be a priority because that's, that affects everyone. Part of the issue is, uh, I've been around too long probably. Um, what I've found uh, back in the 1970s when I was starting to get in the education business, there was a priority that was set by President Kennedy in dealing with people with disabilities. And it was amazing how that priority changed the whole world. I, I was in New York State at the time, and people came out of institutions who had developmental disabilities and who had mental illnesses, and they were taken care of. Housing was provided, jobs were provided. I was part of job training program, I was part of an education program, and amazing things were happening because it was a priority of the country. That priority has virtually gone away. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, 
we closed our, our institutions for mentally ill in Oregon, I believe, in the early 80s with the promise that the money would follow uh, the clients down. Well, it didn't follow them at all. It uh, was underfunded, and we found people in mental illness out on the streets and in our jails. Los Angeles County Jail is the biggest holding uh, place for uh, people with mental illness. That's where our priorities have shifted. We don't have that priority anymore. Thank you. Patrick? Thank you. I probably don't need the full two minutes because a lot of great things have been said. Um, I think one of the, the things that hasn't been said is we need to stop broadening the definition of a basic need. Uh, one of the things that the legislature does, and it's uh, well intended, is trying to uh, take care of more people, trying to uh, broaden the definition for what constitutes someone who's handicapped or, or, uh, or um, some other level of, of service that's going to have to come from the same pot of money. And so the more people we serve with the same pot of money, uh, that's going to get spread thinner and thinner and thinner. So that's one thing we just need to be careful of as a legislature in constantly broadening the, the definition of what is a basic need so that we're taking care of the people that really are uh, the most vulnerable. Thank you. And Shamia? I, I agree with, with Representative Sheehan that there's been a lot of good things said. I think one number that has not been mentioned yet is while we have a, roughly a $15 billion state budget, the state actually gives away $30 billion a biennium in tax expenditures. And so we like to talk about how there isn't enough money, but there's this huge pot of money that the state says no thank you to through tax credits, tax deductions, and tax loopholes. And I am certain that many of those are incredibly valuable. They are investments in jobs. They are deductions that help middle class families cover their basic needs or take deductions for, for example, a home mortgage. But there's also the question about which ones are in there as waste, which ones are in there because somebody one year had a really powerful lobbyist who got a deduction carved out for their giant corporation and nobody's ever questioned that. So I think that when we look at the state budget, I don't think we just look at the $15 billion state budget. We look at the entire state budget and we cut waste wherever we find it and that includes in our tax expenditures. For me, if the tax expenditure is not actually creating good Oregon jobs that are allowing people to pay for their homes and support their families, then it's not investment, it's spending. Or if a tax deduction for an individual is not helping middle class families deal with things like college tuition, transportation, and their homes, if it's just you know a mortgage deduction for only for wealthy people, then I think it's a time right now when our state can't afford that because we need to Thank fund you. basic services. Thank you. Okay, now we have an audience question, and it's uh, about PERS that came up. So um, I'll just read this. I was going to try to summarize it, but I think it's better just coming from the voice of the asker. Could the candidates discuss um, their positions on PERS reform and the impact PERS is having on our ability to fund schools or other public services? And so I'd like to throw that out to Shamia since she's gone last a couple of times. So you, you, you ready for this one? I am. Okay. As a school board member, I am, just as, as Representative Johnson, I am acutely aware of the impact of PERS on our schools. As a school board member, my hand was forced to lay off teachers in order to come up with our PERS difference that we had to pay back to the state. That's absolutely true. And so despite what has been represented by my opponent actually in some mail pieces, I do support PERS reform. We have to reform that system. My criteria for any PERS reform it has to actually save money, it has to be fair, and it has to be legal. And I would support PERS reforms that were bipartisan and presented by the governor if they met those three criteria. That being said, I will not use the Wall Street crash as an opportunity to bash the people who teach our kids the people who put on bulletproof vests every day to go to work because unlike most of us they might get shot at work or the people who are running into burning buildings while the rest of us are running out i won't take this opportunity to bash them but the fact is the wall street crash damaged our pers fund and we need it to ha take it on a sustainable course forward so to be clear i do support pers reforms that are fair save money and are legal thank you patrick well, uh, we're walking into a session with $900 million, as you all saw, that we have to come up with uh, from day one. 
the, the $900 million that, that wasn't there the last time. And when we have an entire K-12 budget that's roughly $5.7 billion, you know how, what a big hit that's going to be. That's two Columbia River crossings, okay, before doing anything. So to say that, that, we, um, that we can't do anything about PERS, that we shouldn't do anything about PERS, we should have modest, modest reforms, I, I think that's uh, going to continue us on the path that we're, we're on right now with larger class sizes and, and fewer teachers. There's just, we've got to do something. Now, the legislature did do some things with, with PERS, and the uh, Supreme Court ruled that uh, we couldn't touch the retirements of the, the folks that are already in the system, that are already drawing retirement. And really, we're just going to wait for a generation and a half uh, for those those populations to work their way through the system before those reforms really come in and, and take place. But in the meantime, we can we can stop the three percent pickup. We can stop uh, the minimum returns without uh, it, and and just the uh, the maximum of whatever the market's doing when it's doing well. Um, there is room to to reform PERS. We have to. We absolutely have to. Thank you. Chris, what do you think? Well, PERS has come up quite a bit. Um, I'm a PERS person. Tier 2, I'm not a Tier 1. And then in 2003, there's essentially a Tier 3. So there have been lots of attempts to reform PERS already. And like Shamia said, I completely agree. PERS reform is something that we should study very carefully. But let's be clear. The, the Supreme Court's already made it very clear for us. We cannot violate the law, period. And to try and go and make reforms that we're going to end up in court and waste millions of taxpayer dollars on is not okay. So it does have to be fair, it does have to be legal, and it does have to truly save money. By the way, no one much talks about this, but the Pew Charitable Trust did a study very recently that pointed out that the Oregon PER system is one of the best funded in the country. So there are some disconnects here and definitely we need to deal with it. But as Shamia said, we don't need to be just pointing fingers at public employees. Everybody needs to pay their fair amount. And it's not PERS that caused the state to get into the problems they're in now. So fair and legal. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew? Well, along with uh, most of the other freshmen in my class, I didn't sign up for PERS. Um, I, I think that it is the elephant in the room that people don't want to talk about, and the reason is politics. People know that if they talk about PERS, that the firefighters union may not endorse them. They know that if they talk about PERS, that the Oregon Education Association may not endorse them. And so they run for the hills and they hide under the desk. You know, I had the opportunity to hide under the desk in the last legislative session on the foreclosure bill. I have experience with foreclosure. I was asked to sit in the room, and I didn't get sent to Salem to hide under the desk. So I went to the room, and I took the hits, and I stood up to the big banks, and we passed a foreclosure bill that was good for Oregon. And in spite of the hits that I took, I'm proud of that. And when it comes to PERS, there's no question that there is a path that is legal. There is a path that is fair, and there is a path that will prevent our state from falling into the ocean financially. But we have to elect people that are supported by groups that will let them have that courage. We have to elect people that will stand on principle and say that the value of our state of Oregon is greater than any one interest group or any collection of interest groups. And I've proven that I will do that with other issues, and I will definitely do that with PERS. Thank you. Mark, what do you think? Well, first of all, I think we have to clear up a little bit of the rhetoric. Um, taking on the PERS issue doesn't mean we're bashing employees. It means we're trying to reform a system that is not performing as it was intended initially. If you look back on the original verbiage surrounding the creation of PERS, it was originally designed to create a retirement system that might produce something like 50 or 60 percent of a worker's salary in retirement. Um, we've gotten way beyond that, obviously. The other thing I think it's important to say is, you know, maybe we do have one of the best funded public re employee retirement systems, but 
tell that to the parents of the students who are losing their positions and, and suffering the overcrowding here in Gresham Barlow School District. Something has to be done. Doing nothing is not an option for the 2013 legislature. I'm working closely with Oregon School Boards Association, with the Oregon Business Association, with the Portland Business Association, as well as groups like Stand for Children and Chalkboard Project. And thus far, we've submitted legislative drafts on eight different PERS reforms, none of which are going to take away promised benefits to beneficiaries, but these are all issues we're having means tested now. We're getting legal opinions on them, but it's such a thing as just saying, should an employee be able to retire making more in retirement than they did when they worked? Peter was able to do that. He didn't break any laws. He didn't do anything unethical, but the system allowed him to do that. Uh, we don't need more Mike Bellottis in Oregon taking 40 some thousand dollars a month out of our kids' classrooms. We have to do something. There are many, many common sense things that can be accomplished. It's going to take a legislature with the courage to take the issue on head on, and these situations need to be solved bipartisanly. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. So far, I've been connected to Mike Bellotti somehow for, <laughs> for a couple of times. Um, what irritates me about that particular connection is uh, Mike Bellotti got a package from the University of Oregon to coach there. And there's people who were anti-PERS who helped build that package and use PERS um, uh, to build that package. And that's, uh, that, that's kind of a cheap shot on that. I, um, I've been in 35 years in education, and I did get uh, a good PERS benefit. And it's, uh, you know, that was, those were deferred payments. Those were payments that I sat down as part of a negotiated agreement. And, and in the 90s, we had, uh, we had a choice of being on variable and fixed, and some of us took variable um, PERS options, and we could have gained or we could have lost. But things were happening in the 90s, and it created an influx of money into the system that uh, is, uh, could be viewed as unfair. But I'm one of those people that got that. Also, the courts ruled that I have to pay a portion of that back uh, because of what happened in 99, a portion of my PERS was uh, 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 people were on, who were on fixed benefits got the full uh, benefit. So we have to pay that back. Um, my, my biggest concern is that there's an attack across the country on not only public, the private sector's already lost their pensions. The public sector, now we're going after the public sector. They're going to be gone eventually. They'll, they'll pick it away till it's gone. And what we're going to have left in 20 and 25 years are people without pensions. It's not going to work. Thank I could explain more, but I got a red card. So. Oh, okay. I didn't see the red <laughs> card. Yeah, thank you very much. I really have some good ideas on how you can build that program so that everyone could have a pension. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. I would like to um, move to our closing statements, and I'd like to go in reverse order and start with Mark and go down, work our way down. Well, thanks again, uh, everybody, for being here. Thanks, uh, women voters, for sponsoring this, putting in the time and effort to do all this stuff and make the cool little placards up here in front of us too. Thanks for your artistic ability. Uh, these are serious times. Um, Oregon is in the midst of still some very, very serious times. We uh, have 17,000 fewer Oregonians working today than we had one year ago today. That's not sustainable if we want to have quality education, if we want to have quality health care, if we want to have quality public safety. We have to focus on putting Oregonians back to work. Secondly, we have to continue to make progress on the reforms that we passed this last session. We have to continue to move forward to make Oregon, Oregon a place that creates a, a work, uh, an educated workforce that is the envy of our nation and will continue to bring businesses here to locate in Oregon, to stay in Oregon, and to work here. Uh, we have to continue to have the courage to take on the issues that need to be addressed. We've talked about some of those today. Um, it's time for the legislature to do what they can do best, and that is make some common sense policies that move this state forward. It's a, it's, a, it's a responsibility to be a legislator. You're one of 90 lawmakers for a people of about 3 million in this state. It's a sobering responsibility, and I take that seriously. I think my record speaks for itself in my first session. I was able to be intricately involved in passing many of the significant legislation that came out of the last session. I think I've been uh, recognized for being an effective legislator. I'm honored to have the governor's support as well. You know, reaching across the aisle is something that we need more of in this state. But uh, we must continue to move forward. We need seasoned, experienced le leadership in this state. And uh, I'm excited to have an opportunity to continue to serve not just the state of Oregon, but House District 52. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter. 
I got into this campaign because I'm concerned about how big money has influenced our elections and influences our decisions, not only in state and local legislators, but across the country. Um, I see the private sector pensions have virtually gone, and eventually we'll see public sector, if people have it their way, will be gone, they'll be eliminated, and we'll be replaced with some other form of pension program. And starting in the 1980s, we've had a massive shift of wealth that we've never seen before in the history of this country. That shift of wealth has resulted in an unequal balance in um, those of us who have and those of us who have not. And that's been an elephant in the room that hasn't been discussed. And it hasn't been discussed because the reality is we got a lot of people out there voting, or not voting, because they feel like they don't have a voice. I'm told that our PERS is too expensive got six members of the Walton family on Walmart. They have as much wealth as 93 million Americans. They control as much wealth. There's a local CEO who work in a very popular com uh, company who makes $96,000 a day for his job. But see, someone like me who's on PERS, we're not worth that, see, because we're not the, really the job creators. That's what the selection is about. We've had this huge shift, and we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to piecemeal our tax system. We're going to piece. We're going to continue to underfund our schools, and yet we're going to we're going to pass taxes that will instead of making ninety six thousand dollars a day, we're going to see someone making one hundred ten thousand dollars a day at the expense of people who are middle income workers. Middle income jobs have been shifted overseas, and it was done so that profits could be made, and we're not facing it. And then we're taking money away from the people, the workers who actually earn their work every day, it's not right. That's why I'm in it. Thank you. Patrick. Thank you very much. It's been my honor to serve the people of House District 51. And I want to take kind of a, a, a different tack in closing and tell you about the other side of, of serving the legislature that not a whole lot of people know about. It's the constituent advocacy services. We've talked a lot about policy uh, today, but there's, uh, the, there's this other side, this human side, that if you're ever stuck in some uh, government bureaucracy or somebody's just not treating you well from the government, you can call your state representative and they can help you. And some of these stories have been my favorites. There's um, I, I stopped a Salvation Army camp from having a spring water trail uh, brought through the, the middle of it. Um, got the Parks Department to agree to mitigate the, the design and, and prevent the 1,200 kids, mostly gang kids, from, from downtown uh, from having a, a camping experience that's interrupted by uh, people on bikes and horses uh, riding through the middle of their camp. Um, I have helped restaurants get their video poker machines back when a, a when a bookkeeping error screwed up the, uh, uh, got them out of compliance. Um, I've actually assisted in an international parental kidnapping case, which was bizarre. Um, I've gotten banks to, to stop foreclosure on homes, and, and I've stopped uh, three businesses from being put out of business because of legislation that would have regulated them right out of business. Um, and my favorite story, you might have seen my television commercial that's got Darcy in it. She was a victim of domestic violence. And she came to me because she didn't know where else to go. And watching her grow over the last year and go from being a victim of domestic violence, whose life was in absolute chaos, PTSD uh, and, and all of that, no one would believe her because victims of domestic violence sometimes recant and they don't follow through. Uh, well, I got in there and said, I believe you, and, and we're going to take this to the DA, and we're going to get this through. And so I worked with her and the victim's advocates, and uh, we got it through. The guy got uh, convicted, and I sat with her at sentencing and watched this guy being let out in handcuffs while she cried. And she is a different <laughs> person today because somebody believed her and advocated for her. Thank you. Shamia? Thank you very much to the League of Women Voters and the other groups who have put this together. It's not often in these low-profile races that we get a chance to come before the public and before our opponents and be clear about our position. So I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm a school board member, a business attorney, and I'm a mom. I have a real skin in the game when it comes to Oregon's future. In fact, my little piece of Oregon's future is over there asleep, but I think he was asleep from our PERS discussion. Kind of put him out, I think. But um. I believe in Oregon as a place of opportunity for everyone. I believe in the kind of Oregon that allowed me to do well in school, put myself through college and law school, that allowed my brothers to find jobs straight out of high school from skills they learned in high school. And the bottom line is when three poor kids from Dufer, Oregon can grow up to be home-owning members of the middle class, that's Oregon at its best. Because if we have a shot, everybody has a shot. 
And so that's the Oregon that I believe in, where any kid, regardless of what their mom or dad are up to, if they're willing to work hard, can have a better future. Where any person who wants to work can find work, work that they can support their family with. Where anyone who wants to start a business can start a business and be successful. That's the Oregon that I believe in. I know that that Oregon exists because I experienced it, but I'm afraid that we're losing it. And I'm running for state representative because I know we can bring it back. And that's why I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew. Thank you. You know, um, in my opinion, East County is the center of the universe, and it always will be. It's my home. It's a place where my great grandparents came and where I was raised. And I don't want to have to leave, and I don't want my children to have to leave in order to have good jobs. And my work in Salem and what I did on city council in Troutdale, it has had a result. The result is that you look at groups that never agree on anything and they've endorsed me. From the Building Trades Council and the Iron Workers to Associated Oregon Industries, Oregon Business Association, and Portland Business Alliance. From Democrats that are elected to Democrats that have never run for office before. People that have watched what I have been able to accomplish. They've watched that when I make a promise, I follow through. And they've watched that I fight for East County and for our community. They all agree that I've done a good job. They all agree that I've accomplished what I set out to accomplish. And I'd like to give you one prime example. Pressure Safe is a small business that is that has started in Wood Village and has almost 20 jobs, family wage jobs, with full benefits. That business is there because I helped bring it there. I worked with that company. I worked with Wood Village and Mr. Peterson, their city manager. We use the Enterprise Zone law that helps attract businesses and help them grow in our community, and it worked. And while we sometimes, and I call this the silly season, we sometimes see mailers that look a little strange to us, a, a bill that's designed to prevent identity theft characterized as, a, as an identity theft pitfall giveaway to the big banks. But there's one thing that I know for certain, and that is that when a company like FedEx moves into Troutdale and pays $350,000 a year in property taxes, which is 10%, of Troutdale's police budget, that if we have to let them have an abatement for three years so that for 27 years they can fund our police department, that's one heck of a good investment. Thank you. Chris. Well, thank you to everybody for uh, staying and watching us uh, talk back and forth here. It's been uh, a very enjoyable experience for me. Thank you to the chamber for sponsoring this. Um, you know, it's kind of weird when we all sit up here and tell you how great we are. So uh, I just want to say in closing, you know, I spent a lot of time in law enforcement. I was out there taking care of domestic violence issues. I was out there taking care of assaults and drunk drivers. I've done all of that. At Mount Hood Community College, I continue to try and train the workforce of tomorrow. I suspect some small business owners may have taken some of my classes. So. I'm very invested in this community, every, every bit as much as, the, as my colleagues up here. I've lived out here for 15 years. My wife grew up in Corbett. They used to have that little gas station right across from the Springdale School where the yellow light flashes. So I know people out here. And I too really, truly value East County. And with my skill set from education, my skill set from policing, my skill set from working at Fred Meyer and dealing with customer service, I believe that I have the tools that will help me, if you elect me, to represent you as a strong ethical advocate for East County. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And before we close, I want to give a special thank you to Metro East Community Media for airing this event. and. Uh, our next one that will be following. And let's give everyone a big round of applause. This is impressive.